Hello and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study at First Baptist Church of Lake Garfield. Um, tonight we're going to be in Psalm 130 if you want to be finding your place to follow along in the text of Scripture. Um, Psalm 130, just sort of continuing uh, with selected psalms. And uh, uh, so let's start off by going to God in prayer and asking for Him to bless our time together. Father, we thank you for your word, uh, especially uh, for the hope that we have in you, that you are a forgiving God and that you, will, uh, that you have abundant forgiveness that is available over any sin that we have ever committed, over any number of sins that we have ever committed. As uh, your word says, where, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, and we thank you for that forgiveness and we ask that you would bless our time in your word for it's in the name of Jesus we pray amen so we are in Psalm 130 tonight as I said before uh, and I want to say a couple of things before I actually get into this psalm the 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 superscription says uh, you know hope in the Lord's forgiving love um, and it's a song of a sense so you know, like ascending. Um, so I want to say a couple things about how this psalm speaks to worship and our attitude in worship before I even get into what the psalm is actually about, which is hope in the Lord's forgiveness and, and crying out to him when we are just overwhelmed with life and, and especially with our own sinfulness and our guilt. But the fact that this is a song of ascents uh, it's A S C E N T S, which what it meant was, you know, Jerusalem, the temple was on a mountain, and the pilgrims would go, they would ascend uh, to the the temple to worship, and what this means, the superscription above the psalm means, is that this was actually sung on the way to worship, and and that ought to say something to us about how we prepare our hearts. Uh, when we come to worship, I mean, do are we, uh, you know, running around the house fighting with everybody? You know, wh whoever wrote that song, "Easy Like Sunday Morning," never had to get kids ready for uh, church on Sunday mornings. I guarantee you, because th it's not an easy thing. Um, but but it's it says that we need to prepare our hearts before. And even on the way to worship, and, and that's what this psalmist does is, you know, writing this is singing this on the way uh, to worship. Um, and something else, uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the first verse uh, to say this about our, our worship once we get to church um, in our worship service. It says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Notice, you know, Psalms is, is the hymn book of ancient Israel. We, you know, we have a divinely inspired hymn book um, in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. That's what this is. And notice how this particular Psalm, and it, it not all Psalms are like this, but there's, there's a good variety of Psalms that do this. But this particular Psalm, it, it, it's sung directly to God. Um... It's, you know, out of the depths I've cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. You know, singing directly to God. I think that's something that uh, in probably the last 100, 200 years or so, that's something that we, in, in our Western culture at least, in, in Christ, I can't speak to other cultures uh, because I'm not familiar with them, but at least in our uh, culture here in the United States of America and, and a lot of the hymns that have been handed down to us, and they're great hymns, but it seems like to me they are songs about God. And, and while those are definitely necessary, you know, we have psalms like that. I, I think there's a, a great lack of songs that we sing in worship singing directly to God. Now, there are some, uh, and here's where I think a, a lot of modern worship music can actually help us because if you if you look at a lot of the modern songs they're, they're songs uh, sung directly to God and so um, maybe that's something that we ought to 
take a look at you know if you're you know I've got friends who are in like southern gospel music and I love southern gospel and I love the hymns that we sing uh, maybe if you write songs maybe you could start to think about maybe writing a, a few songs to God in whatever your particular uh, genre is um, that, that I think that would be awesome because it's something that we need but now let's actually get into the psalm there are eight verses in this psalm uh, and uh, it's, it's divided up into four stanzas two two verses for each stanza so you know just like if we have a hymnal and there's four verses uh, there, there's there's eight verses here but if it were in the hymnal it would be four verses uh, one and two go together three and four and, and then five and six and and seven and eight so just just like that and so what I've done is I've, I've characterized each of these four stanzas with one uh, keyword and the keyword for verses one and two is you know th this is about what we do uh, when we are overwhelmed we're we're crying out from the depths if you will and so the, the key word for verses one and two what what we do when we're overwhelmed uh, with life, especially with our own sin and guilt, uh, as this psalmist was, the first thing is cry. He says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. Uh, the, I, the word depths there, you know, he's, he's talking about life just being overwhelmed. You ever, you ever thought, Lord, I'm drowning here? Um, I'm just so overwhelmed with everything. The, the depths, you know, it, that word was used to describe the sea, but in, you know, Hebrew life, all, uh, often that was, you know, used metaphorically to describe chaos. And so, you know, here, here's a person going down for the last time, you know, just crying out uh, and, and coming to realize that, you know, if, if God, if you don't help me, there's just no help for me. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm surrounded uh, by this chaos and all of this that's going on in my life. And so, uh, Lord, hear my voice. Lord, let your ears be attentive. The, there's the double use of, of voice there to, you know, to indicate that this this person is really crying out loud um, and, and crying to the Lord directly because he's the only one that can save. And so that, that would be the first word, just to cry. Well, then after you cry, then what, what do you do next? Well, the, the key word for verses 3 and 4, I think, is trust. Um, if you, Lord, in verse 3, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? In other words, you know, if, if God w was not forgiving... None of us would be here. And so this is a, you know, if God kept track of all our iniquities and punished all of our sins, as soon as we did them, none of us would be here. Um, and he uses the word iniquities, not the word sin. He uses the word iniquities. Now, iniquities is, you know, I think it's used around 200 times in the Old Testament. Uh, it's a used a lot by the prophets and, and it, the idea behind it is that it's bent or twisted and and that describes us when we're away from God our lives we're, we're bent our, our morality our nature we're bent we're twisted out of shape and and the only thing that can fix us is God and so none of us you know if we had to stand before God with all of our iniquities we would not be able to stand. That's what he's saying here. In verse 4, here's where the trust comes in. But there is forgiveness with you. you know, that's, that's the psalmist's hope. You know, uh, The cry is, I, I'm bent out of shape with sin. I'm, I'm drowning in a sea of iniquity. And Lord, my trust is that you are a forgiving God. That, that's your character. I trust that you forgive. And that's my only hope. But, but there is forgiveness with you. But then in verse 4, we see that this forgiveness has a purpose. Why, why does God forgive? It says that you may be feared. Not, 
not terrifying fear, but reverence fear that that God may be reverenced and worshipped and and come to be known as loving and forgiving, and, and we can have that relationship with Him. That's why He forgives us is because He loves us, not because uh, we deserve it. Uh, if you deserve forgiveness, it's not forgiveness. It's you know getting what you deserve, and so nobody deserves forgiveness. And so we. We've, so there's our two words so far is cry and then trust. And then when we come to verse five and six, I think the key word there for us to do when we're overwhelmed is, is to hope in the Lord. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. So first of all, he's hoping in God's word. God's word is sure. God, God cannot lie. And God promises forgiveness. Uh, you know, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's His word. If you believe in Him, you He offers forgiveness and everlasting life. And so, that hope, uh, he, he He's waiting on the Lord for that hope, for that deliverance from the the situation that He is in. And then in verse six, I, I love this picture. And if you've ever worked third shift, you, you can appreciate this picture. Uh, my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. What's that all about? Well, if you're the night watchman, what what do you? why is the morning so important? Well, first of all, the morning is guaranteed to come. And so if you're waiting on the Lord, the Lord is guaranteed to come. There, you know, every, every night is followed by morning, and you know that is sure to come. And if you're hoping and trusting in the Lord, and and calling out and crying out to Him for forgiveness, just like the morning is guaranteed to show up, God will show up, and so He's waiting for Him. But but what if you're the night watchman? What hap What also happens when morning comes? Well, you get relief. You see, it's not just that God shows up, but when He shows up, there is so much relief. There's forgiveness. Um, you know, I my I used to work third shift back when I was much younger, and uh, you know, I've done that on a couple of jobs. I just cannot do it anymore. It just I my sleep pattern. I, I don't know. I'm just old, I guess. Uh, but I just can't do that anymore. Uh, but when I did that, you know that seeing of that sunrise starting to you know peek over the horizon that was always a welcome sight because that meant i was going to get some relief um, and you know just like that night shift person at night watchman watches for the daylight watch and hope in the lord because if you've put your trust in him it, it is a guaranteed hope and, and then the final word uh, the final key word in verses 7 and 8 is tell. So you, you've you cried out to the Lord, you've trusted in the Lord, and now you've put your hope in Him, and, and you know that He has forgiven you. What do you do next? Well, you tell others. Uh, here, here's where He goes. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, He was He was singing. This, this is a psalm, a song. He was singing to God. Uh, it's a song that records a prayer, so he's praying to God, but now he's praying and he's singing this song to others. And it's a song about God, which is, you know, the vast majority of our Christian songs. Um, he says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is loving kindness. Now, loving kindness is a word it, you know a very key old testament word hesed it, it means god's covenant love his covenant faithfulness it's unconditional god made a covenant with the the children of israel and and he kept that covenant even when they broke it he kept the covenant and that covenant was ultimately fulfilled in jesus christ coming and, and being the messiah and dying on the cross not only for the sins of Israel but for the whole world so that if we put our faith and trust in him we have eternal life 
And so for the, with the Lord, there is loving kindness, that unconditional, faithful, covenant love, um, which is what loving kindness means. And with him is abundant redemption. You know, like I said earlier, the Apostle Paul said, where, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so uh, there is abundant redemption. He, he buys us back and, and puts us in a, a relationship with him. Uh, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. God's forgiveness is complete and it's thorough. And, and you don't have to worry. Well, can, can God, I know God can forgive this sin, but I've done this really big thing. Can, can he forgive that too? Well, it says here that he forgives from all iniquities. And so it, it you know, there there is no sin that God cannot forgive. That is, I mean, that just speaks to the the grandness, the the majesty, uh, and the sufficiency of the atonement that is in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, whatever your situation is right now, if you're in despair, cry out to the Lord. Trust in Him. Trust in Jesus, the risen Savior, and then hope in Him. Place your hope and your faith and your trust in Him. And when you do that. Go tell others. Well, that's all I have for you tonight. And I pray that this has been a blessing to you. And I look forward to seeing you again on Sunday. May God bless you.